enjoy this talk given at the Austin Center for Spiritual Living, where we live and teach the principles of science of mind and spirit. For more information, visit austincsl.org. It is so good to see all of you today, and it's such a beautiful day. I'm so excited to be here. I always get excited to be here. You know, I went onto the internet the other day and I did a self-test. This is a test that I had did some time ago. It's on at realage.com. And you might look that up and go to it and you answer all the questions, go through this thing, and you come up with your real age, not your chronicle, chronological age, but your real age. And uh, I was so delighted because I had done this oh, seven or eight years ago also. And the age that I got at that time was um, six years younger than my actual chronological age. But this time, it was 11 years younger. So you see, it really is worth it to know how to lie effectively. <laughs> uh, but at any rate, maybe just a little bit of fudges. But I think it's a wonderful exercise to go through because you, you kind of challenge yourself. How do I really see myself? We all want a balanced life. And there's certain steps to balancing our life. And we're going we're gonna to talk some about those steps. But uh, it all starts, I think, by recognizing that each of us is not just a body, not just a mind, but we're a combination. We're body, mind, and spirit. That is the whole of it. And we don't separate it out and say, I am a body, uh, <clears throat> or I have a body, and leave it at that. Somewhere in the Science of Mind textbook, Ernest Holmes says the comment, I am spirit, and I have a body. And some of you may have seen that, and I latched onto that years ago because it made the distinction. I am spirit, and we're told all through our teaching, as well as all of the great philosophical traditions of the world, religions and, and others, that all there is is spirit, and all we can possibly be is spirit. And we have a body, and we have a human mind, and these are aspects of us that we use in order to be ex able to express the uniqueness that we are. And sometimes we forget that, and we think of ourselves as kind of fragmented in a, w in a way. I'm going to talk a little bit today and, and summarize some of the things that I think comprise the reality of who we are and some of the steps that we can go through in order to be able to give expression to our life. I came across a quotation that I like very much from Deepak Chopra. Most of us know who Deepak Chopra is. If you watch uh, public television at all, PBS, he's, he appears often there in one of his programs. He's a medical doctor. He's born in India, uh, trained conventionally, traditionally in the United States in medicine, and has become very, very well known throughout the world for his insight into the mind, body, spirit phenomena. And he makes a comment in one of his writings that I latched on to, and I really love it. He says, my tormentor today is myself left over from yesterday. Isn't that neat? My tormentor today is myself left over from yesterday. And of course, this tells us what we already know that we move forward in life, but we keep dragging along behind us the kind of stuff that is going to continue to impede our ability to move forward fully. How we move forward, we, make, we inch our way forward. But you know, the time comes when to really have a balanced life, let us let go. And one of the things that we do to let go is to stop looking at it. I have a little <clears throat> kind of a cartoon thing at home. 
and it's on a it's on a card that I printed out and I got it years ago and I even had it here one time and I projected it one Sunday. It shows a man walking along a, a, a mountain path and there's a big mountain and there's on one side and he's walking along this this path and you see him just from behind. He has a walking stick and a little backpack on him and you see the vista off in the distance and it's really a lovely kind of a thing and it sort of warms you and you kind of want to be there walking along that path too. And the inscription says, don't look back. That's not the way you're going. Isn't that wonderful? And it is so profound. And that's the way so many things are. Simple, easy to understand, recognizable, profound. And yet we tend to deviate from that from time to time. My tormentor today is myself, left over from yesterday. I think we see from this the importance of what you hear me so often talk about is kind of a personal affirmation for myself, if you will, a personal mission in life for me, and that is to discover, develop, and express the truth of who I am and to help other people do that same thing. I cannot possibly do it for myself unless I'm working on the behalf of helping others. I mean, it works together. I mean, we we only have a complete set of hands, if you will, I'm speaking metaphorically now, if they can come together and embrace each other. And that's the way it is with each of us working on behalf of the other. There's a fellow by the name of Ellis, and Robert Ellis, that's who he was, and he developed a system of uh, therapy. He's a psychologist. He developed a system of therapy that was uh, uh, it was referred to as cognitive cognitive therapy. And I'm, I'm looking for the right terms to describe a little bit of this. It came about as a result of him disassociating himself from the uh, psychoanalytical approach um, that is so commonly used and uh, the behavioral type of approach to understanding oneself. And instead, it became what he, as he, I say, cognitive theory. Cognitive means to think about something. And the bottom line in his approach to things, was not so much digging deep, which is very useful, and some of you have been in therapy and have done that, and I know that I have too, but there is another step that we can take, and that is to begin to change our thinking, change our thoughts, and we find that our life is going to change. If you if you want to change your life, you've got to change your thinking. And many of you know that in this teaching for years and years, and you still find it in various places in our literature, there is a, a line that we use, a little slogan that is so true and it's so popular, that's, that's why it persists. And that is change your thinking, change your life. Change your thinking, change your life. It's just too simple. And so we have to look, we have the tendency to look past that. (laughs) There is an unlimited power that's available to you through your cognitive faculty, if you want to call it that. And all that's saying is that through your ability to rationally think about things, your cognitive faculty, your thinking ability. Change your thinking, change your life. There's nothing magic in this, by the way. It is based in universal principles. And I have four elements of the universal principle, let's call it that. Um, A simple summary. And they go like this. Number one, your beliefs create your reality. It shall be done unto you as you believe. 
whatsoever a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. These are biblical quotations that support that idea, and we find the same thing going all the way down through the years. What you hold in your mind, you're going to express in your life. Like my dad said, Richard, if you <clears throat> keep talking like that, keep saying those things, you're going to come to believe it, you come to believe it, it's going to be true in your life. And of course, I didn't believe it uh, <laughs> at that particular point. But I've come to realize how true that is. So number one, your beliefs create your reality. Number two, of these simple universal principles, and really they're, they're intertwined, at least three of them are really intertwined here. By saying one, your belief creates your reality, uh, this next one is pretty uh, clearly related to it. It's a corollary, corollary you could call it. Universe, the universe r responds to your energy with an effect. What you says, what you sees is what you gets. That's Flip Wilson, the great philosopher, who, the late great philosopher Flip Wilson. What you sees is what you gets. The universe is going to respond to the energy of your belief. The third one of these simple universal rules is control your beliefs and you control your experience of life, because in controlling your beliefs, you are controlling your thoughts, and that's going to determine the experience of your life. And then the final one of these here, um, which really kind of includes everything, is there is a universal power that operates for the very highest good. Now, I want to talk just briefly about that, because Sometimes people think when, or when they're talking this way, they're talking about the great God that's way out there somewhere is controlling it all and watching everything that's going on. And he's got a clipboard as well as maybe a computer nowadays, being able to keep track of things. And then every once in a while he can delete or cancel or, or overwrite something. All right. Uh, it doesn't work that way. And there is no personal interaction with that power. I'm not saying there's no personal interaction with God. There's always that personal interaction, but that's an interaction of love. And that's an interaction when activated within you or when you are aware of it, you open the possibilities of being able to receive all that has already been provided. But there is a law. We exist within this principle and that's just the way things work. So that when I say the universe always works for the highest good, what I'm saying is there's a nat natural inclination for God through nature expressing in life to do what it does according to its own patterns. And we live within that. And we have a place within it. And we have a uniqueness within it. So our task becomes the task of discovering, developing, and expressing that. And how do we do that? We do that by shutting up and listening. No, by quieting ourselves, by coming together like this in groups and being able to talk about it. Or listen to somebody like me get up here and babble it, sometimes not even sure what I'm saying. But recognizing that there is something moving within me that you can identify with and recognize that it moves within you. And that's a creative something. It doesn't mean that I'm the great authority. I'm the farthest thing from an authority for you. But maybe I can help stimulate within you or trigger a little flash of insight that opens an awareness to the true magnificence of who you are. Can you really believe that? That you are wonderful. You are magnificent. And I know there's bound to be somebody out there who's thinking, yeah, but you don't know my life. That's right. I don't know it. 
And the more you persist in knowing it, the more you're going to hold yourself with that perspective. Is this making any sense to you? I want to inspire you. I want you to all raise up your hands and say, Hallelujah, brother! We don't do that sort of thing around here, do we? Maybe, maybe, maybe we really ought to. Change your life. Think new thoughts. Turn your attention away from what you don't want. Don't look back. That's not the way you're going. And turn your attention to what you do want. That's one of the big difficulties that a lot of us have because we so, have so much, we spend so much time occupying our thought with what we don't want, what we'd like to get away from, what we'd like to discharge from our life. That often we don't take the time to really examine what it is that we really want to experience in life. And some people say, well, yeah, I kind of know what I want, but I just don't know how. I can bring that about. Your question in our class the other night, exactly. The how is what tends to stop us. It's holding the picture, being steady with that, intent on where it is you're wanting to go, and then sitting back and allowing the universe to response and inspire you with what the next steps might be for you. You hold the vision of your desired experience and your vision is like a magnetic blueprint that is going to attract to you whatever it is that you need to move in that direction, even if it's just the first steps. There's a process by which this happens. And we can learn to use the process. And the very first step in this process is that know what you want. Stop being concerned with what you don't want. Know what you want. Do you know when you ask, walk up to somebody sometime, yeah, yeah, do this, good experiment for, experiment for you when you leave here. Not somebody that's here, because they've already been coached a bit. But walk up to somebody you don't know and say, Mary Jo, what do you want in life? Do that with a few people and you'll find after a while there is a lot of not so much confusion, it's just unawareness. And then walk up to the one person, which is the mirror in your bedroom, and look at their and say, Ed Pope, what do you want in life? What do you really want in life? And when the, yeah, but I don't know how, comes up, you say, it doesn't matter. Because there is a how. There is a way. And that will be revealed to me. And you see, that's one of the most powerful affirmations that you can make in your life. You say, I don't know how, I don't know what, but it will be revealed to me. It is, even better, is it is being revealed to me right now. And then you can fortify a little bit by, by saying, I am open, I'm awake, I am ready, and I'm totally accessible for this universal intelligence to work through me, in me, and to show me. This is an enormously powerful thing. The only problem is that there's no secret mantra or secret process that's going to make it mysterious and allow you to feel like you're tapping into something that is yours totally and that nobody else has. You see, we're so often taught about or presented different bills of goods of that sort 
that if you come and you take my seminar and pay $1,200 for this intensive weekend, you will walk away with the secret of being able to transform your life and have everything you want. It doesn't happen, folks. I know, because I've tried some of those things. Not that there can't be value in some of those processes, because there can be. But usually, they're just one step along this road or this path, this process of illuminating the overall tendencies or processes that are going on in your life. And that, that can be useful. It can also be very, very expensive. As I say, it's a stepwise process. Number one, know what you want. And let me say something else about this, because this is so important. And you find it stressed by everybody that teaches this sort of stuff, talks about this stuff, preaches on it, and sells expensive seminars on it. The more clearly you can define what it is that you really want, the more you will find that sometimes it just appears. When you really get clear on what it is you want to experience in life, it's almost as if there's something that becomes sensitized within you, as well as so that you can see opportunities and possibilities, as well as magnetized about you, that you begin to attract these possibilities into you. And it's just by being really, really clear. That's where the process ends sometimes with some people. But you can carry it another step, too. You know what you want to begin with. Then create a picture of it in your mind. What does it look like? Don't get too carried away with all the goings-on around it. Just, what does this look like? I know what I want, okay? Let's see, what, what could I want? A partridge in a pear tree, okay? That's, I've always wanted a partridge in a pear tree. I know what that is now. That's a pretty clear definition. But what does that look like? You see, I could look into my backyard or in my mind and see a beautiful pear tree back there filled full of pears, all kinds of other things around it with this partridge bouncing around from limb to limb. Now, I know this is a ludicrous kind of a silly example, but it's what we do. I think it's what's absolutely necessary. What are all of the elements that I can bring into that particular picture that supports the idea that this is a reality? I create a vision around my want, okay? And then I refine it. I refine it in every way that I possibly can. And in, in, in the refinement of it, there's a process that we talk about that's called... Uh, Contemplative meditation. The, the, the term that's used in our discipline is visioning. And that's become very, very popular throughout our movement. And I've never liked it because that, it, 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 anyway, I don't like it for various reasons. But what it is, is the ancient process of contemplative meditation. The contemplation involves the particular thing to which you are giving your attention, and the meditation is an attitude or a mood that you are in when you do this. So it's simply sitting down, creating a mood within which you feel centered without a lot of disturbance that comes from external activities and goings-on, and you direct your attention to 
a vision of that which you really want to experience. I mean, that's many, many more words and it makes it more complicated than it really can be. It sounds more complicated. But that's that meditative mood. You get into that, you begin to see it, and then you create a scene while you're in this relaxed, inspired, and clear attitude that implies the fulfillment of whatever your desire is. Oftentimes that's just enough. But there's some other things that you can do along with it too. And one of these things is that you can ask some questions. You're at that particular point and you're feeling very receptive. I find myself often when I'm doing this kind of thing, one of the first questions that I ask is, what more do I need to know about this? What do I have to do? What do I have to change? And then you sit and just be there. You know, this process, you say, well, gee, it sounds kind of squirrely to me. I have a dear, I had a dear friend. He died a few years ago. A kid that I grew up with, he was right down the block, you know, grammar school, high school, Boy Scouts, joined the Navy at the same time started college about the same time and that whole sort of thing. He went off and he became a, a very, very successful uh, president of a Western operations of a large U.S. company. He was an engineer too. And uh, I remember visiting him one time and he was telling me about some of the things that were going on in his life and he had a lot of things all the way from dealing with the union to working on the technical side with some of his engineers and all. I said, how do you handle all this? And he said, when you get some of these problems that you're talking about, you're dealing with them. And what he told me was about contemplative, contemplative meditation. He didn't use those words. He didn't even know what those words meant. He said, what he do? He's go into his office, close the door, leave word with his secretary to not be disturbed by anybody except maybe God. Or his wife, same thing. <laughs> Turn the lights off, just have a desk lamp on, yellow pad of paper, a few pencils, and he'd sit down and he would write one sentence on the yellow pad that described the best way that he could, whatever it was that he was inquiring about. And he'd say he'd just sit there and relax and sit there and relax. And he says, it has never failed him, but that ideas began to come. And when they did come, they came so fast that he could hardly keep up with them. This is a real simple, simple, straightforward process. And you think, now that I know about it, I surely must use it all the time. No! I just don't quite get around to it, except once in a while. And in that once in a while, usually when I'm really stuck on something, amazing things happen. Think what our lives could look like if we would do a practice like this on a regular basis. And some of you won't do it at all because you don't believe it's really going to work for you. It might work for somebody else. But maybe one or two or three of you will, and you'll find that it can be life-transforming. I may even try it. <laughs> no. You see, in doing this and in asking those questions, what often happens is that we, we lock in our vision 
and we lock it in even more by incorporating some positive statements or affirmations as we, we talk, of them, talk about them in our life. They have all kinds of information in the information uh, rack over up against the wall there, and I'm sure there's something on affirmations. Pick it out, or see our bookstore manager. He can help you also with some literature or point you in the right direction. But affirmations are just very simple. And the simpler, the better. Don't put a lot of clauses in there, a lot of contingencies, or a lot of uh, things that uh, you, you, you seem to feel you have to include because it can't possibly happen unless you include it. Let me give you an example. I read a book a number of years ago by Deepak Chopra. There we go with Deepak again. This was called uh, Live Longer, oh, Grow Younger, Live Longer. And uh, this was an affirmation that I said for months. I'd go out on my morning walks, and I began to repeat this over and over. And I was having some physical problems at the time that I don't have now. And walking was a little more difficult for me. And the affirmation was this. This is on page 28, by the way, on Grow Younger, Live Longer. Every day, in every way, I am increasing my mental and physical capacity. Ah, that's too simple. Give me something mystical. Every day and every way. I'm increasing my mental and physical capacity. And I got into a rhythm every day and every way. I'm increasing my mental and physical capacity every day and every way. And on like that and on like that for maybe walking a mile. I said, well, did you get bored after a while? No, I got inspired. And then I had another one from Deepak Chopra again. That I'd use. He he talks about the biostat. The bi, you know the thermostat is the instrument that measures the temperature in a in a room or a thermometer they stick in your mouth or somewhere measures the temperature. And uh, the biostat is what measures is is his term for. Uh, the readout of the overall physical well-being. He says, my biostat is set at a healthy blank years of age. Isn't that wonderful? My biostat is set at a healthy 60 years of age. Hey, that's 22 years younger than I am. That's not a bad... And I can... Not only that, but I can accept that. See, I can accept that in my mind. And most of the time I feel that way. Well, why not all the time? And you see, there's something really magical here, but it's not really magical. It's what goes on. It's, it's like that book Dispenza, Joe Dispenza wrote, uh, called You Are the Placebo. You set into motion processes actually, can modify the way the genes are going to react within your body to bring about the kinds of biological processes that will conform to the idea that you hold. That's an incredible thing, isn't it? You know, you say, well, that's mind over matter. Yes. Yes, it is. And a few years ago, this would have been poo-pooed by the, by the conventional healthcare community, and now they're beginning to look at it and use those ideas. My biostat, biostat is set at a healthy 60 years of age. What a thing to affirm to myself. I look and feel a healthy 60 years of age. Wow. Wow. Are you willing to try some of this in your life?
Every day, in every way, I'm increasing my mental and physical capacity. And not a whole lot more that I can say on this topic right now without getting even longer-winded than I am. I think we can change virtually anything. And I know this can be argued. I had a good friend, a minister friend of mine. I haven't heard from him in years. A fellow by the name of Dr. Um, Luis Del Aguila. Luis, guy about this tall, with a booming big voice. He was a Peruvian Indian, that's what he was. He was a religious science minister, fantastic minister, and he was actually my first teacher when he was in Albuquerque and I was living in Santa Fe. And I remember uh, one time asking in class, but Luis, what about irreversible conditions that people experience? And he looked at me and he said something kind of interesting. He said, well, Richard, we live in an eternal time. So what are you worried about? <laughs> and you know, I, I never forgot that good old Luis. There is an expression of life. An expression of life for each of you. And you're now prepared to have that expression in this moment, in this time. You don't have to wait for the eternity of time for it to show up. Let's have a moment to quiet ourselves. Know that we live in a universe, a universe which is a field of love. It is limitless. It goes beyond all sense of dimension. And we are one with it all. Somehow or another, it's almost as if we are like that drop of water that impinges with the surface of the infinite body of water, sending out waves, dispersing, and totally diffusing through the whole thing. We are part of it in that way, and yet still, maintain our own unique identity as an expression of it. This is what it means to be made in the image and likeness of God. All that God is at that infinite level, limitless level, I am right here, right now, at this finite level, this particular level. And because of that truth, I know that all I need to do is open myself, see clearly, speak the word believing, and I will access whatever it is that I need at this moment in my life. These are the words for everybody here, everyone everywhere. The peace, the power, the love, the joy, the abundance, the intelligence, the creativity, whatever I can think of, resides with me in this field of limitlessness. 
So I declare right now for myself and everyone here that there is an openness, a receptivity, a willingness, and an accessibility for whatever the good is necessary for perfect balanced functioning in life to come into experience in our personal lives. I truly give thanks for this. I am so grateful. I allow it to be so, and together we can declare, and so it is.